secretly recording people's uh, auditing sessions, right? Mm. Miss Gavridge said, go take a look at what the Mormons are doing. Mormons are very engaged with audiovisual material in terms of proselytizing. Yeah. The Mormon church, they have a broadcast facility at BYU. Mm -hmm. He sent us up there to look at their broadcast facility and see what they were doing. I remember there was a theater in Salt Lake City where they had the life of Jesus. Yeah. I, mean, I knew the guy who played Jesus. He was a Scientologist. Oh, wait, what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what? Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola. And I'm Jonathan Rosales. And this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. As always, if you're only listening and you want to see our faces, head on over to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness. You can subscribe, become one of our amazing supporters, really an advocate for the guests who come on and share their stories. It means a lot. You can comment your support for the guests as well and hit that bell so you don't miss any episodes. So today's guest, I was so happy when he reached out. He had <laughs> seen me in one of my uh, videos with, I think, Danny from Scientology talking about how I was an actress in a Scientology film, actually a couple. And he reached out and said, oh, I was a director for Scientology for decades and I have quite the perspective. So we're really excited to get into this and we have more to discuss as well as far as how David Miscavige wanted to copy the more Mormons as far as production goes. That's a whole thing. We'll get into that. But for now, thank you so much for joining us, Mitch Brisker. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to meet you. I, as I told you, I'm a fan. So <laughs> That's so awesome. Well, I appreciate your support and I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. I know you've done some things with Aaron and I believe you said this is your first interview with a non-Scientology channel, right? Yeah. We don't trust outsiders, but... I'm, well, that's I'm, exciting. You know, I'm taking the big. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Except ex Mormons. Yeah, no, it's like, I know plenty of ex Mormons. There's a lot of them in Scientology. Uh, no, this is great. No, we're all part of the same community. It's not. There's no separation there. Yeah, more part of the the ex cult community. Yeah, I agree. Well, we have a lot to discuss, so let's just get right into it. Okay. I think, first of all, well, I have um, Jonathan here, my husband. He's co-hosting today, for those who aren't aware who's next to me. I'm still trying to get used to the whole co-hosting thing, so like, <laughs> just throw him in. Throw him in he's one. a new yeah. co-host, um, but it's going to be great. I wanted him to join this one because he's also in the industry of directing and filmmaking, so I thought it would be a great fit. Yeah. So first, I want to know, Mitch... What enticed you to join Scientology? Because you joined in the 70s, you said. I kind of want to hear what it was that got you interested. Okay, so here's the very short, gory version was I was a 23-year-old film school dropout. I was addicted to heroin. I woke up a week before Christmas and found my girlfriend dead in the kitchen. Mm. She died of an overdose. And through a, a director who I'd been involved with in a film, uh, who had recently started doing Scientology at Celebrity Center, which was a relatively new organization then, and it was being run by a woman named Yvonne Gentsch, who's the one who founded Celebrity Center. And I found myself there. Uh, so, I mean, I was, my life was completely shattered and I was broken. I mean, I would, somebody said, this can help you. And the people seemed genuinely sincere. There was no big pressure to join. Right. There wasn't a big, uh, no one was trying to, a big play for money or anything. I ended up living with the staff, which I don't think that's ever happened. And I don't, I think I'm the only one in the history of Scientology who actually got into it because of a personal crisis and then lived with them. I lived with them for about six weeks. I did a bunch of courses. Uh, there was not a lot of pressure to join. It, the only agreement was, if I applied myself to it, I could handle my drug problem, which I did. And I ended up going back to college and getting a degree in cinema from CalArts and starting a career. I don't want it to sound like I'm saying there is there was something so good about it back then and that what we need to do is reform Scientology because what happened, what was going on at Celebrity Center back then was a fluke. It was only because of this one person, Avon Chen, she was mm. running it, who later, L. Ron Hubbard, you know, took her off of her job and worked her to death. And she died in her 50s of a brain tumor. That was my experience. And so that's 
kind of what enticed me to get into it is it offered a, a way of disrupting my drug use mm. so that I could recover. And, and that could have happened in a myriad of other circumstances, but it happened in that one. And it offered two things that you'll recognize, stability and community, a structure. Mm. And very importantly, it plays on people's idealism because it was a very idealistic group of people. I mean, all cults have at their core in terms of enticing people, some form of idealistic alternative to whatever your life is now, mm -hmm. whether that's reaching your full potential, building a new civilization without criminals or, or becoming worthy of joining the kingdom of heaven and being re reunited to your family for eternity and getting your own planetoid or whatever. <laughs> it's all based on painting this, this uh, picture, this like, just this reality, like, you know, don't look over there, look over here, things are going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And then eventually you slowly, it chips away at you and it becomes your identity and you don't really notice it, but your actual core identity has been replaced by something else. And, you know, that's when the real trauma starts. Mm -hmm. I said I was going to give you the short answer, but that was not. <laughs> no, it's fine. We don't do short answers on cults to consciousness anyway. <laughs> we get into the weeds, so that's fine. I have a machete. We can just slash through the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> so you were thriving then as a commercial director in the 80s, and that's how Scientology kind of recruited you into directing for them, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. You've done your homework. I appreciate that. Uh, so, yeah, what happened was uh, I, I was well known at celebrity center because of my my backstory you know i was almost like a project in terms of having this drug addicted kid you know it's just not something they do today people go to narconon there really wasn't a narconon that it's a very strange experience but so i was really well known like everybody knew me and they knew what i was doing and they knew my career and i was on and off continuing to study scientology they were in the 80s i was approached by a marketing executive uh, a wonderful woman is no longer in Scientology. She teaches art to children in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, she said, we were doing a, this campaign for Dianetics. We need a commercial director. We've heard about you and we know about your work. And would you be interested in working with us? So I met a guy named Jeff, Jefferson Hawkins, Jeff Hawkins, who was notably one of the first uh, executives to escape Scientology, having been beaten and physically assaulted by David Miscavige. Oh, wow. So Jeff and I worked together. I met Jeff and he, and he had been doing some commercials. He put together this little creative team. There was me. There was another Scientologist who'd been on a creative director with Shia Day and had uh, worked in advertising in, in Chicago. And so we started, and then Jeff had this, he had really great ideas about how to market a book. And so the Dynamix book had sold, since its publication in 1950, it had sold by the mid eighties it had sold 3 million copies, which is really abysmal. And so Jeff designed this very complicated, robust marketing plan, which went everything from having good creative people in place for messaging and all the way to having relationships with, uh, with book distributors and retailers and media buyers. And he had this idea to do these questions ads that everybody knows about. Uh, and if they don't know about them, if you show them to them, they'll say, oh, yeah, I remember that. Mid-80s and late-80s, we sold 10 million books, right? And so th this was a huge thing. And people, you know, it, they remember this. Dianetics, the book, that book is the Trojan horse that Scientology uses to get people in. Okay. And they've done that very successfully. Mm -hmm. They haven't really done it since then. They've had a couple of bump ups where they kind of did it. But what happened was, I did not know this, but but concurrently at Scientology's international base out in Riverside, where the studio is, they were trying to get these training films done, these technical training films. And I'd seen a number of these films when I was taking Scientology courses, and they were of such abysmal quality. I mean, I know, having been to film school, I know how hard it is when you're a kid and you take your first workshop and you have to make a film. When I was in school, we were shooting 16 millimeter. We couldn't make a film on our in the morning on our phone and show it to the class in the afternoon, right? <laughs> I mean, I, like when I went to film school, like there were dinosaurs walking the earth. It was, you know, things things were different back. <laughs> things were different back then. Uh, 
you know, but we had to learn to use a light meter, which nobody does anymore because they can just look at a histogram. But uh, which is no replacement, kiddies. Learn to use light meters. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. So it must have been the early 90s, maybe mid 90s. I remember seeing commercials on TV for Dianetics by L. Ron Hubbard. You got it. Did you have anything to do with those commercials too? Those were him. That was all you. Nobody had anything to do with it but me. Okay. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) As far as the creative uh, inspiration for that, it it was just you and Jeff? There was one other guy. I don't know what his outcome is. I don't, he was like very highly up in. Scientology, public, uh, on the bridge, as they say. He wasn't a Sea Org member or a staff member. Uh, he provided a lot of the creative. I mean, Jeff came up with the questions ads, which, you know, I say it's the most, I I can't prove that it's the most successful uh, campaign in book publishing history, but um, can you, you can't even name another campaign in book publishing history, right? right? Can right. you? So it must have been. I mean, they're starting to do a lot of uh, uh, marketing of books. Like I was just reading about, um, uh, book talk, the TikTok phenomena and the, the you know, ByteDance, the company that owns TikTok, they're now going to the publishing business because so many uh, self-published authors have been selling books mm-hmm. on TikTok. But it's all romance books. You know, they're all, it's like romance and fantasy, but I don't know if you've heard about that, but that's just a huge emerging marketing space. But Jeff came up with this brilliant idea. There was text space. Remember, it would say, is it possible to be happy? And then it would say page, whatever, right? And, you know, you could do Mm -hmm. those ad infinitum, and they were really easy to do. They were so simple to produce that you could literally fax. Yeah, I said fax. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That's part of the dinosaur technology that we have back then. You know, you could literally fax the ad, the text uh, to a post house. I mean, I had a deal with a post house. I would just send the the, the text of them and they just punch the ad out. So it was a machine. We had a machine going with uh, in terms of the ads and then how they got distributed. And then there were deals. Jeff had made these deals with, uh, you know, co-op auditing, like you see with, with car dealerships, you know, uh, you'll see a TV ad. And then at the end of it, it'll mention a local car dealership. It's, it's real big in, in car advertising, but he, Jeff was doing it at the end. You'd see, you know, available at B. Dalton's or available at whatever. I used to joke, yeah, Bob's book bunker, whatever it is. But they would go to these companies and they make deals. They'd say, we'll do co-op, op, uh, you know, advertising. And then you put our book prominently displayed. So it was, uh, my point is it was a very complex and very successful program. Meanwhile, up at, at the international base, they're trying to make these films. These films are so bad. I'd seen them as a student and you just, you just held your nose and you cringe because they had information in them that you needed to do your course. Right. But they had this horrible, they had this horrific problem. They never got them all done. There was 26 of them. The ones that they did were just absolutely, they were so amateurish. And meanwhile, there's this group in LA that is just exploded on the scene and is making TV ads and selling books. So David Miscavige, I mean, I wasn't in the room when he said it, but I'm sure he pulled a bunch of executives in and said, you know, who the, who are these people in LA? We can't even get a film made. And, you know, they're, they're like selling millions of books. I mean, Jeff Hawkins was eventually rewarded. He got the crap beat out of him and uh, he fled Scientology. Because that's kind of the way Miscavige rewards people. Mm. So he pulled the whole operation up to gold. I was invited to come up there to start directing these films. And then eventually I took over a lot of other things. And the entire marketing operation that Jeff was uh, uh, an executive in, that was also moved to gold. Because, you know, Miscavige, he's all about consolidating power. We were so successful. And, and having fun doing it, it was too distant outside his purview. You see, you know what I'm saying? So he wanted to consolidate everything at the international base. So, and ever, and ever since he did that, which was really in 1990, there was no, no nothing ever repeated at that level, uh, statistically. When I went up there, the entire crew, they were banished to the galley. They were like scrubbing grease out of the, out of the fryer because they were not able to produce a film. So wow. I didn't know this. I went up there, they let them all out of jail and we did a film and we did it. L. Ron Hubbard said, any of these films should be complete in two and a half weeks. And it had never been done. I did not know this when I went up there. So I went up there and I'm like, okay, cool. Let's make the film, right? And we did it in less than two and a half weeks. 
And it was like, I, you know, I don't want to sound like uh, I'm tooting my own horn. On a good day, I might have been an eight in L.A., but, man, I was an 11 at gold. So if you know what I mean, yeah. it was so bizarre. I mean, I can honestly look at all this now, but I felt like uh, I don't want this to sound racist, but I felt like, you know, the the explorer who crash landed on a primitive island mm. and the indigenous people picked you up like you were a god. That's kind of like what I felt like because it was like. You know, I didn't know that I was walking into that. You swooped in to save the day. And of course, it's going to feel good to have your work recognized and appreciated. And especially from the higher ups and David himself. Yeah, sure. And I just have to paint the picture for those who don't know, which is probably a lot of people. So when I went to Gold, it's like two hours away. I remember <laughs> I took like a weird back route where there were no cars and no buildings and it was barely a road. And I remember my mom being like, are are you going to be okay? Because she saw my <laughs> GPS and was like, where are you going? And I'm like, yeah, if I broke down, this would be really bad. But anyway, I pull up and it's this gorgeous, enormous building. They have like 50 acres, right? And it's like a castle. It literally looks like a castle. No, 500. 500 acres. Oh, oh. my gosh. And just like rolling green lawns. And so you go through this gate, you have to go through this through the security and you know I'm an actor for whatever it was and we pull in and I just remember when I went in to get my hair and makeup done so fast so on top of it so punctual I walk into this room that is just floor to ceiling in wigs I had never seen that many wigs in my life they put one on me actually and then I get into this studio and it's this sound stage, this huge sound stage. And it may have been the first one I had ever been to because I was still very, very, very new to acting in LA. And I was just in awe. It was incredible. And to this day, it is one of the most efficient movie sets or TV sets or film sets that I've ever been on. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, yeah, that's your, that's a pretty good description. Uh, you're absolutely right. And, uh, the one thing that I could add to that is that the cost for them of not doing that is horrific. In other words, the cost of them not being that efficient. On time. Not making you feel welcomed and, mm. and, and them not appearing to be very professional. The repercussions for them not doing that are not good. They're just like. Interesting. Yeah. It's something that I thought about deeply and that I've written about and that I refer to as the high cost of failure. And the, probably if you said, why do you think they had to hire you to come up when L. Ron Hubbard was a, a self-identified film genius oh, <laughs> who had written hundreds and hundreds of, of papers on how to do film? Probably the reason they had to hire me, the single reason was that the cost of failure is so high that they could never get any of their staff to do it. I mean, eventually I was able to work with them and get uh, some of their staff up to a level they could do it. Do you guys think that you're on set at the same time, Shalise and Mitch? No, we were never on set. I was. I, I ran through my, I'm pretty good with faces, but I think I was probably working in LA then. And uh, you described to me kind of the scenarios. Where, unfortunately, we didn't. I mean, I might have been there. I, there was a couple of other people directing. So yeah. I, I might have uh, crossed you, pa passed you in the hallway or something. But but yeah, you described it very accurately. This is also a funny side note. So when I was starting acting in LA, I, it was just so hard to get auditions because I didn't have an agent. I was just like every single day scouring casting sites. And Golden Era Productions is the casting director. So I would see these like multiple casting calls a day for these Golden Era and they would have like a number, like Golden right. Era Productions number 30 or something, whatever it was. And I just knew that I, she would always give me an audition. Anytime I submitted, I would get an audition. And so <laughs> I remember thinking, okay, well, <laughs> my self tapes were awful. I don't, I wonder if I still have those. If I still have them and I can find them, I will put them in and you guys will cringe and laugh with me. It is so awful. It's before I even knew what a self tape was, how to do it right anyway. <laughs> So another funny thing is she would never send a script. It was always improv. So she would send a scenario and then you would just have to like do whatever it was. So I remember one of them 
I was screaming at someone, like screaming at an employer for doing something to me. And I was really pissed off and I was dysregulated or whatever. I ended up booking that one. But the one that we did at the big studio in the soundstage was I had to pretend to be sick and think to myself, I'm always sick when it rains and it, it would be a voiceover later. And then I had a daughter who would say the same thing because she would hear me say it. So it was like, I heard my mom say it and then I said it to my daughter and now that's what she thinks too. So that's the one that I distinctly, distinctly remember looking into this mirror and like get, getting all this emotion and just like, it was the whole thing. But I will say guys, once I knew what was going on behind the closed doors of Scientology and it was exposed through Leah Remini's aftermath, I was like, hell no, I am right. never, ever, ever, ever acting for them again. Even though it was like, like I said, I always got an audition. I almost always booked it whenever I auditioned. And it paid pretty well for someone who was new to LA, you know, in 2013, 14. I think it was like 250 a day, 300 if you had to go to gold because it was so far away. And that was a decent paycheck for someone who's just trying to get into acting. Never again after that. Yeah. Plus, if you could, you at least you got some experience off to the side, like being run through makeup and costumes, right, and, yeah. You know, set protocol and all those things. You'd get some experience. But I mean, come on, when you were there, two hundred yards away from where you were working, there was like scores of executives that were incarcerated Jeez. in their offices and just being like tortured. I mean, like North Korea. So, and I, and I was unaware of it as well. Mm. So it's one of the reasons that I had to speak out because I didn't know about it until 2015. That's a different story, but. Oh, wow. But yeah, I mean, they hire a lot, a lot of people. I mean, I know people, I, I made friends with actors who were not Scientologists and they really liked coming up there because they really all felt they got treated really well Yeah, and they got fed well. I mean, yeah. you didn't mention the food, but right, did you not? Yeah. You got fed really well. Like usually you're on a, on a, a low budget kind of thing and you know, you get handed a sandwich or something. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the budget. It goes up to like, you know, Spielberg level where they bring in celebrity chefs from Europe. But, um, yeah, people would get treated well. They'd get treated with dignity because that's what the mission was, you know. It, it was almost like a PR, like a public relations action. The, I mean, the crew up there, the people you interacted with, they were basically forbidden from proselytizing or trying to bring so anybody in. So interesting. Body. And they, they didn't necessarily want to because they're supposed to be doing their job. So if the makeup girl, the wardrobe girl, or somebody on the, if they're like taking time out, to to proselytize to you, they're not doing their job and they're going to get in trouble for that because it's not like they deliver Scientology at that base to people. Like you can't go to Gold to take a course or it's just, it's oh, a production facility. Right. I do remember thinking, I'm really surprised that they didn't try to get me to join Scientology. I was kind of waiting for the shoe to drop, right? Because I went there, yeah, I think yeah. two days, I was there, two different jobs. And I was like, When's it going to happen? When are they going to slip me a pamphlet or something? And they never did. The one thing that was kind of creepy was I wasn't allowed to go anywhere without supervision. So oh, if yeah. I had to go to the bathroom, someone had to walk me to the bathroom and wait outside the right. door. And I was like, why are they being so weird? Like, I'm going to go explore something on my own. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a big deal. They're very, very, very tight on security. And you remember the hallways in that castle are like giant. We called it the castle. Yeah. It's such a weird term because, I mean, it was mostly sprayed stucco and styrofoam. Yeah. I mean, it's a nice <laughs> building, but it's like, it's, it's like, ca it's a castle like Knights of the Round Table in Orange County is a castle. Yeah. It's, it's like made to look like a castle. There's no stone or anything fancy yeah, about it. Yeah. It's like castle ish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but remember the, in that building, the hallways, I mean, you could drive a car in the hallways or, so those hallways would get used for setting things up. Like you could have turned the corner from if you turn the wrong way from leaving the restroom and you would encounter like 50 yards of, of tables of, upon which there were maybe the next generation of e-meters that were being oh. looked at or documents, you know, documents laid out in date order because there was some project going on and nobody can know about that stuff, right? Got I mean, it. you have to pump yourself up like NSA level security. You know, you feel about, you're like, yeah, like, 
like your enemies need to be really powerful and your secrets need to be really classified. It's kind of like how you just become more important, right? Mm -hmm. Where basically your most of your enemies are laughing at you and your projects are like nobody really gives a, a crap. If you, <laughs> but that's why you couldn't walk around there because the security security is just uh, it's pretty crazy. You you might have seen something that that you shouldn't have that would me, be mean nothing to you, but right. you know. I would love to talk about the dark side of gold because I know this is something <laughs> that you were later privy to um, after the fact. You know. You didn't really know what was going on while you were there. But one example that I remember from Leah Remini's The Aftermath is someone could not get out. So they literally they found an actor's car who was unlocked and escaped in their trunk yeah. just to get out. So it's like the security is just as bad leaving as it is coming. And so I'd like to know from your perspective, what are some of the things that most people don't know? I think now people know everything. They just there's just more of it to tell. I mean, they've been very much exposed. I mean, you just said yourself, you saw. Yeah, they can't leave. I mean, like there's a Starbucks down the street. I mean, if I wanted to buy myself a half hour in the morning before a shoot or whatever, and just drive out the gate and turn right instead of left uh, and go to Starbucks, I could do that. But there's no way that they they. Uh, I mean, if anybody there wants to, even when we'd go location scouting, I mean, I used to live there during the week. I, I was married. I had a family in LA. I, I was home as much as I could. It wasn't as much as I wish I would have been. So, you know, nobody questioned my coming or going. Mm. You know, what do you need to scout a location? You just need me and two other people, really, maybe four. But they would fill a 15 passenger van with crew members who wanted to go location scouting because they just wanted to get the hell out of there. Wow. And that was at least a way you could have a day's excursion. Uh, but it would just really piss me off because it would slow the day down because I'm like, you know, why do I have a props person coming out of location scouting? Right. Uh, but anyway, um, but even on in that situation, like the, the scrutiny when the van would leave was insane. Like there had to be what's called a, like a computer pleaded staff work, a CSW, a kind of internal document that Hubbard took from the Air Force. It's in the Air Force manual. It's how you write a thing like you want to buy, um, you know, missiles for your your plan. So you have to write a thing up that says, you know, this is why I need them. This is how much they cost. This is why you have to approve mm -hmm. this. They had to do that just to leave, to write this very complicated document. They'd have to often go on the meter to be checked to make sure they weren't they weren't go intending to use this opportunity to escape. Jeez. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. Yeah, I, I felt very uncomfortable uh, for years. Uh, and I just kind of was so attached and connected. You know, it's, it's what you do. It's like Bruce Springsteen said, you know, you get used to every, anything. And after a while, it just becomes your life. Mm -hmm. Yes, my real philosophers are all rock and roll singers. So Mitch, from one director to another, I'm curious to know, how did you feel about your body of work? Did you feel like you were producing good work? Did you feel like you were evolving in your career? Yeah, but only within that bubble. My work got better and better and better and better over the years because I was able to train a crew. Like that studio that you were in, and that's a really impressive studio. That's mm -hmm. one of the nicest studios in Southern California. That soundstage is really nice. Uh, I think you would agree, Shalise. Yeah. I mean, they built that because we were working in this crappy little studio when I went there that was about the size of a basketball court. Oh, geez. And they ended up building that studio because I had gotten so much work done. And I never felt that I was building a legacy of work because I knew that those films would always be redone. It's the nature of that genre of filmmaking. Uh, there's going to be, I guess, there's social problems where a person appearing in the film then speaks out against Scientology, which happened, and then you have to remake that film. Really? There's also just the fact as time goes on, they're going to want to remake them and refresh them. So my mission was not to create a body of work that, because I never thought it, it was always disposable. My right. mission was primarily, and which was not the one that I was hired for, my mission was to get that group, which I believed in very strongly, up to the point where they could produce spectacular looking work, as I used to put it, work that would just by nature of its quality command respect for Scientology. Mm. You know, because like I was that in. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, 
But, and if you look at like the Scientology network, a lot of that programming on there was produced by people at Gold that I trained or people at Scientology Media Productions who were influenced by my style of working. And so I had a huge impact, but body of work, no. But, um, you know, I helped people up there. I mean, I've had people who escaped reach out to me when I'm not going to tell their stories. These are people that have not spoken out, but uh, who ended up having very successful careers in media, uh, in feature films and television media and commercials who reach out to me after I left and said, you know, uh, because of you, I, I realized I could have a career on the outside. And because the confidence that you instilled in us, I had the, I had the courage to leave. And, you know, so I have yeah. that legacy. Mitch, I'm curious to know how, what was David Miscavige's role in all of this? Was he giving you notes as you're producing the, the, the work? I had solved this problem that had been going on for 15 years that, they couldn't successfully get these films made. And uh, everything having to do with those films went through him. Like when I first arrived, you know, as a director, when you are uh, embark on a project, you're going to interpret it for yourself in terms of stylistically what your approach is going to be, filmically what your approach is going to be, how you're going to, uh, the kind of characterizations that you're seeking to bring out of the actors, all in pursuit of an overall message or a kind of an impact that you want to have on an audience. And so this is something I was not unaccustomed to doing, but in, in Scientology of Gold, for the director, it's like mandated that you have to write all that down and then get it approved. So you're mm. really being micromanaged. So he would have to approve all that stuff. He would approve everything, the talent, the, ca the, the costumes, the set designs, the director's interpretation or direction of how he's going to do it. This was all put together into a package and approved. And then over time, as he saw that I didn't really need, I mean, it got to the point where he was tied up in some legal thing. Maybe it was Lisa McPherson because he was gone for months. And then I, I would have to send him the, the rushes or the dailies every day for approval, right? And write up notes about why I did it this way and why I did it that way, how it was going to go together and be edited. And then after a while, it was just, just send me a finished film. Hmm. You know, I was like a fully functioning adult when it came to making films. So uh, yeah, it went like that. And I remember he was gone. We, we completed three films in one of his absences. And uh, when he came back, there was one shot out of the three films that he asked for to be adjusted and not, not even rejected. So it, it went really smoothly for a long time. And it, it didn't really start falling apart for me until I was, I'm trying to think how to say it. And a good example would be when Anonymous hit, right? In 2008, when that whole thing exploded, it was like, we need the smartest people here to come in and figure this out. So then I worked on a lot of, uh, I worked on videos and, and various different kind of plans and so forth to counter and kind of deflate and impugn those protesters. And so I guess you'd call it like mission creep. Like my original mission was to go up and make films, but you know, it's like then smart creative people become really valuable and you ask them to do other things. And it, then it got to the point where it was like anything of a visual nature, uh, uh, even if it was the designs for an, a Hubbard house, you know, he would, uh, you know, say, oh, you know, just, could, did you have Mitch take a look at this? So mm. That's when things started really getting intense for me because it made it a lot harder for, to disengage at all. It was one thing to just go up, make a film and leave. But when you had all this stuff and you never knew it was coming, it, it get, gets pretty intense. I was wondering, because you're making films to counter the protesters, for example, did that start to sink into your brain a little bit? Or were you still of the mindset that these people are just trying to take down a good thing and you didn't let it bother you? Uh, a little of both. It's kind of funny. You know, people are, nobody's simple. Everybody's complicated, right? I mean, you know, there's this joke, like, you know, you know, Hitler loved his dog, but it's a way of saying and vice versa. But People are really complicated. Nobody is just one thing, right? So you can simultaneously be watching and know that you're a member of an organization. And there's a reason why somebody's holding a sign that says, you know, Mike Rinder Blue, so can you. And you know that he was mistreated. I didn't know about the whole, but I knew about, but I knew Mike and I worked with Mike on a lot of projects, mostly before he was CEO, the commanding officer of OSA. Uh, and I knew that he had been mistreated. 
And so I knew why that person was holding the sign, but at the same time, there's that mission. You get what I'm saying? And somehow Mike had interfered with the mission. I mean, even if the guy who's running the show is beating people up in, in pursuit of that mission, the mission's still there. Even yeah. if David Miscavige drops dead, I mean, we've all got to keep pushing this this thing. You get what I'm saying? So, sure. like, did it start to chip away at me? Like, mm -hmm. oh, maybe I'm shouldn't be doing this. Is that what you mean? I'm just wondering because there's some times where in Mormonism, people would present me with information and it was clearly awful. And I'm just like, no, that's not true. But kind of in the back of my mind, I'm like, but what if it is true? So I just wondered if there were certain things like that that you noticed where people are saying things about Scientology, you're having to make a film to counter it. If at any point you wondered, is there some truth to this or are they just angry protesters? Yeah, no, I, I totally understand. I think they call that cognitive dissonance. Yeah. Because you're looking at one thing and you're, yeah. So yeah, of course, absolutely. It's just, you know, it's, it's very difficult to say, oh, I was wrong about this. So you don't. And plus, you know, there's the old adage about, you know, why you, why, why men fight? Why they go to war? Because they're at a certain point, you're fighting for the guy in the, in the trench next to you. You're not even fighting for the ideology. So you're sort of, you're sort of very wrapped up and engaged in, in winning that particular battle. Um, I mean, in one way, I was, in the back of my mind, I was really glad that Anonymous was happening because it was exposing some of the hypocrisy uh, that I wished would go away. I mean, I didn't wish Scientology would go away, but there, some of it was just so ridiculous. Like, I, my true belief, even though I was a warrior on the front end of pushing against Anonymous, my true belief, my actual honest belief was the church should have done nothing about that. They should have done, like, what they should have just turned a blind eye and said, um, listen, we're too busy to deal with this. We're actually doing something positive. You know, just put out a little statement. But instead, they just went completely absurd. I mean, I was in a meeting when they were organizing the protest uh, against the, the celebration of L. Ron Hubbard's birthday. And David Miscavige, he wanted to set in Clearwater, he wanted to try to do whatever he could to interrupt the protesters before the event happened. So his idea, we were all doing our ideas. You know, it was like a war room and it was like all the smartest people were there. He assumed that a lot of these protesters were young and potentially living with their parents, right? Mm -hmm. so his idea was to hire PIs and send them to these people's houses, the, kids, the young people that they'd identified, send them to their homes and rat them out to their parents. Like, uh hello, I'm, you know, with Church Scientology. And I just want you to know that little Johnny is protesting against us. Well, how could you be more disconnected from what a family is like. I mean, most families would have been like, oh, I thought little Johnny was smoking weed. He was exercising his first, you know, his <laughs> first amendment, right? You know, I'm going to bump up his, his allowance. Fuck you, get off my property. Because, <laughs> you know, he grew up in a chaotic family with an abusive father and never had children. But this was like, he's so self-righteous that he thought, oh yeah, when I tell those kids' parents that they're protesting against us, and this was a Clearwater, where like most of the citizens of Clearwater wish, wish Scientology would just be, you know, leave, right? So there's a real disconnect. So, but me, I thought, why are you even bothering to do this? Like these people, they have a short attention span, which they did. They're all going to go away. It'll blow over. But they react to it in such a way that it amplifies it and amplifies it. Mm. You know, I mean, the whole anonymous thing happened because of the Tom Cruise video leaked and they exploded about that. And then they, this, a bunch of people who were, uh, saw them as trying to uh, censor the internet, you know, picked up pitchforks and torches and went to town protesting against them. What was the video that leaked with Tom Cruise? Oh, you know the, the 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 black turtleneck video. I don't remember seeing. Oh yeah, sorry. I, I the, just the late nineties. Everybody knows about that video. <laughs> I think I know what you're talking about. I was grew up like in a cult. E? I don't know anything. It was no. It was 2000. <laughs> I think it was late 2007 uh, when it leaked. Or it. Tom was given an award, like this huge medal. It, every year, mm. the Scientology has a celebration of the International Association of Scientologists in its headquarters in England, and they give away two or three medals to Scientologists that they feel 
had some spectacular record in the in one of their social betterment activities, mm-hmm. like illiteracy or the most favorite one is fighting psychiatry or whatever. They give them a medal. So they decided to give Tom a medal, but his medal was like the size of a dinner plate. <laughs> um, like he's the only person that's ever gotten that medal. Part of the medal winner presentation would be, there'd be a video that they'd show at the event, you know, with lots of pounding kettle drums and bum, bum, bum. And then they would, they would cut together. They'd usually shoot recreations of what the person had done to start like literacy groups or morals groups or whatever. And Tom's involved an interview in which he wore a black turtleneck and he talked about how it was such a privilege to be a Scientologist and about how Scientologists were the only ones who would know how to help in a, in an auto accident. And he really, I mean, he did this video for an audience of the most fervent Scientologists. And, you know, if somebody captured a video of you with your most beloved people around you and then put it on the internet, you would probably be really embarrassed, right? Because <laughs> you're going to act differently. Yeah. His was like a nuclear version of that. He was talking to, to really dedicated Scientologists. Then the thing leaked out and he really, in that context, Looked, it revealed the fact that he was just being a zealot. He was so zealously committed and he was so much in, in in sort of mirroring the identity of David Miscavige in terms of that very strident way of communicating, like which, which we'd seen when he was interviewed by Matt Lauer and other such things. So then somebody leaked that onto the internet. The church tried to take it down, which was the stupidest thing they ever did. Uh, cause you know how easy it is to take things down from the internet. <laughs> a, a, there were a number of sites that capitulated uh, under the legal wow. threats and they took it down. Other sites like Gawker were like, no, it's newsworthy. Cause by the time it becomes newsworthy, you make it newsworthy because you demand to take it down. And then yeah. the fact that it's newsworthy is the reason why it can't be taken down because once it becomes news, you, it's first amendment, right? Mm-hmm. So the the thing went everywhere. The end result was pushback against that. Okay. Well, thanks for explaining the Tom video. No problem. I, I often joke that I don't know what's going on in the world because I grew up in a cult and under a rock. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that I've missed. So thank you for that. Um, speaking of growing up in a cult, I think it was really, really interesting when we spoke about this off camera about how you and David Miscavige would have endless meetings about how he wanted to copy what the Mormons were doing because they were having success with their video publications. And so I'm just dying to know how those conversations went. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I very strongly believe that, that Miscavige was influenced by the Mormon church not by the religion, by any stretch of the imagination. The right. main thing that I think inspired him over the years, and when I say inspired, you know, it doesn't take much to inspire a person or change their entire course. You could be a little kid and see like some actor on the screen and then it's just a little moment and then but that changes your life. You get mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So it's not like we were meeting about it. It's not like there was a program called the Mormon program. There were just <laughs> a few little things. And this is all anecdotal. And even though I believe this really strongly, I can't give you any actual evidence for it other than the correlative anecdotal evidence, right? So first, when we were developing systems, and the first system, by that I mean audiovisual systems, uh, the first one was the system for secretly recording people's uh, auditing sessions, right? Mm. I didn't work on that one because that didn't have anything to do with what my field was. But I was aware of all the systems because I had a key leadership role in developing all of their audio video systems, so film rooms. Uh, if you've ever been in a church, I don't think you have a church Scientology, but you could see them online, the public information displays, which is at a very robust and complex uh, video-driven presentation, self-guided tour Anybody can walk into a church. I have seen them. I walked. Well, you saw. I There's... did. Yeah. Okay, so that was my project. Like I did all. I designed all that stuff and figured wow. out how to implement it and blah blah blah. I mean, there were other people on the team, but that was primarily my project. So when the first systems were being developed, Miss Gavage said, "Go take a look at what the Mormons are doing." Right, and that's where sort of because the the Mormons are very 
engaged with audiovisual material in terms of proselytizing. Yeah. Right. And uh, I read it uh, recently in researching this. I I read an article uh, on the BYU site. Uh, it's there's this, there's a section they have of, of scholarly articles, and it was about the history and development of audiovisual use within the Mormon Church. It was really interesting. Uh, and, you know, I remember before we were really doing films, not the training films inside the church, because the Mormon Church, as far as I know, they don't use internally films to train their parishioners. But externally, they're very engaged in in, in presenting the religion in in media using audiovisual means. So they actually do. That's a little fun fact. They actually do use videos, not to specifically train parishioners because there's not really anyone to train on anything, but they do use, or they did, at least I remember growing up, would have these little videos that we would watch about these scenarios of people interacting and this little boy saying, oh, mom, I really want to be on the soccer team, but they play on Sundays, then him having to make the big decision to not play soccer on Sundays. So we did have all of those little scenario videos that we would watch as teaching tools. Yeah. And that doesn't surprise me. And I'm, I'm really glad to know it. So, um, I mean, L. Ron Hubbard in 1963, when he was running Scientology internationally, he was in St. Hill, England, and he gave a, uh, a filmed lecture, and in that lecture, he says that Scientology is not going to make it unless it's taught correctly, and it can't be taught correctly unless you can see it done, and you can't see it done unless you have film. So he kind of planted this flag in the ground and said, we need films to survive, right? Mm -hmm. But he didn't even do anything with it until 78. But as you mentioned, yeah, so the Mormons, they use audiovisual material internally. Then I remember there was a theater in uh, Salt Lake City where they had the life of Jesus, like this, like an ex exhibition running yeah. continu continuously. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, they did that for Jesus and Joseph Smith. I mean, I knew the guy who played Jesus. He was a Scientologist. Oh, wait, what? Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> what? they were, yeah, the guy, one of the, one of the, the guy who played Jesus was a Scientologist. <laughs> So that's also interesting that you knew a lot of Mormons who were Scientologists. That's like a double cult situation. Yeah, there's a lot of Scientologists who came out of the Mormon church, a lot. I mean, the president of the Church of Scientology for years, Heber Gentsch, he was from a polygamous family. Okay. And then, of course, he was one of the whole's worst victims. So anyway, the, the, getting back to the point about Miscavige and his... It's it's mm -hmm. was more like envy, right? Like it was he wasn't thinking like it had nothing to do with the religious. He was envy of a couple of things. He was envious of the fact that they incorporated audiovisual in a way that the Church of Scientology had not. He's very much an AV fanatic. Like he can't listen to music unless it's coming out of ten thousand dollar speakers. Mm -hmm. He can't listen to you know MP3s. He can only listen to you know full rows DSP files out of a twenty four hundred dollar player. Yeah, you know, he's just a complete gear fanatic, right? So he would always like when we did the first systems, he was like, go look what the Mormons are doing. Then the other thing I think that really got him was the fact that Scientology is a, like a like a service based business model. They sold books and they delivered courses and counseling for money. That's how they got their money. The Mormons got their money through tithing, 10% of your income, mm -hmm. donations. And it's like, God, that's so much. Why can't we do that? I mean, it's hard to sell courses and, and books. It's a lot easier to just shame people into giving you money <laughs> when they don't expect anything back for it, right? We saw under his leadership, we saw the church go from an organization which its founder, L. Ron Hubbard, had forbid people from ever asking for donations without giving them something in return. It went from that to it's a completely donation-based business. I mean, sure, they pull in millions of dollars a week selling books and selling services, but that pales. I mean, the biggest donor in Scientology, which, which is quite a bit smaller than anybody, in, than the top Mormon donors, is three hundred million dollars because they acknowledge their they give awards status awards oh. uh, to their high donors and the biggest donor three hundred million, but the number two is probably only fifty million. So it's not like there's a lot of people giving at that at that level. So yeah, we saw that happen, and I and I 
I've had a couple of conversations with him where he pointed this out about how the, the parishioners in Mormonism, they're paying for their churches, right? Like I read about how the money taken in is then used to build churches. And he's like, what are we doing? We have these crappy old churches that are like located on top of a, you know, upstairs from a bait store. And, you know, the Mormons have all these like sparkling <laughs> edifices. And then the other thing was, it's, I told you there's a thing called an organizing board or an org board, and it's the way that you organize something. It's part of L. Ron Hubbard's administrative technology, mm -hmm. which they, you know, have separate secular schools, which they teach people to use this. You can apply it to a big company and you can apply it to an individual. It's the way you organize things, right? And it lays out everybody who's involved in that particular organization. And But the Mormons have a, a way of organizing where everybody, and I mean Mormons that are actually active, integrated, going to the temple and all that stuff. All those people are on their version of an org board. I've seen it. I shot a film before I worked for Gold. I shot some promotional films for Porsche. I had hired a bunch of guys out of Salt Lake City, film guys, and they were great. I mean, they're just like super hardworking and really skilled. And I saw this one guy, he was going over and I saw his, like he carried this notebook around with him and it's entire, I'm not sure what you call it, but it's everybody in his ward or his parish mm -hmm. and you know, their contact and their, you know, and it's, it's such a robust way of organizing your parishioners. And I had this conversation with Miss Gavage, which is like the Mormons, like they figured out how to get everybody on their org board. Like everybody is so organized. And, and, uh, so not long after that, he started this ideal work program, which we've all heard a lot about. People think it's a land grab or whatever. I think it was a, a sincere effort that failed and then ended up looking like a land, like a real estate grab. But with the advent of, of the ideal work, uh, program, we had what were called OT committees, which were the top pro, you know, uh, people in the field, OTs, operating thetans, very highly, highly placed Scientologists. And the, they, they would, were like the bishops. In Mormonism, mm. that they were responsible for bringing everybody in and activating them and getting money out of them. And so you had this field in Scientology, they call it a field. I don't know what they call it in Mormonism, but it's all the people in that area. Maybe they called it a parish or a ward or this one other word I can't a stake. remember. Stake, that was it, that identifies the hierarchical or, you know, organizational structure. And so, you know, he pursued this uh, or kind of new organizational structure, but keeping it within Scientology, you know, within the, the nomenclature and all that. So, yeah, we have these OT, OT committee members. They're like, they're the local leaders. They're ju it's just so similar to the way the Mormons are organized. Wow. And, you know, today Scientology is pretty much supported by donations. So, like, he pulled that off. So. <laughs> okay. I do have to say, I got to give credit to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm going to use a full name here. They are extremely organized. They have their shit together. And if you think you are not on some list, if you have ever been to a Mormon church, you are wrong because they literally every single week, they have someone who is in charge of taking attendance in the sacrament meeting, which is like the main meeting where everyone is together. Someone's around going with the clicker, counting everybody. And then when you split off into groups, you sign your name like there's literal roll call. And so they know exactly how many meetings you went to within that day. They know if you haven't been coming to church and if you haven't been coming, they will send someone to your house. They will send cookies. They will send notes. They will send whatever. <laughs> and they will find you if you move, because if you even if you move out of state, if a family member or a friend knows your address and they give it to the bishop of your local church before you moved, that bishop will send your records to the new place, your new bishop, where you live in that area. You cannot escape it unless you get your records removed. And that's why I highly recommend it because there's so many people who are like, just leave me alone. I don't want to be Mormon anymore. But they just track you down yeah. because their records are so incredibly immaculate and their history records too like they they know genealogy they they got all the yeah. family trees they know what they're doing and it's just yeah it's really wild i gotta give them credit for that 
Yeah, well, the, they're organized enough to make Scientology jealous. And Scientology is like, you know, you've heard people say that getting off of a Scientology mailing list, it's like herpes. It's never going to go away. <laughs> I think the last evidence, anecdotal evidence of to support what I'm saying is that the Mormon Church, they have a broadcast facility at BYU, right? Mm -hmm. And they do, I don't know, they do BYU football, and they do all kinds of Mormon-friendly programming, family programming, and blah, blah, blah. And when I was at Scientology Media Productions, their broadcast facility helping to set it up, Miscavige had a bunch of us fly up to uh, Provo for the day. Uh, it was arranged with uh, the facility. Yeah, it's funny. There's a Starbucks right across the street from the entrance, and... Uh, <laughs> You know, coffee to them isn't like garlic to a vampire. They just don't drink yeah. it. But, you know, they'll, they'll go into a Starbucks and get a lemonade. Oh, yeah. Hot chocolate. But one of the executives who had literally grown up in Scientology, one of the Scientology executives, we were in the Starbucks. And then as we were walking into the entrance of the BYU broadcast facility, as soon as we got into their property, she looked at me. She scowled, scowled at me and like, you have to throw that coffee <gasps> away now because she didn't want to offend some Mormon, I, I was like, I, I didn't want to explain it to her, but I had to walk over to the trash can and like throw my cup of coffee away. No. But anyway, the point is, is that he sent us up there to look at their broadcast facility and see what they were doing. And, you know, they, the person who in charge of public relations was great. And they were like, when's your flight? Oh, well, you have time. You should go tour the temple. So yeah. they called and we got like a VIP tour of the temple, which was, which was really amazing. Uh, if nobody's ever seen it. The, to me, the most amazing thing about it is that at a big Scientology event, international event, you'll see people with headphones and maybe they're, they're doing half a dozen languages in real time, translating the event. Yeah. At the temple in Salt Lake City, they do over a hundred languages. Yeah. In real time. Like, this is insane. Like the level of, of uh, commitment and technology that those people have. So yeah, I think he was really uh, inspired by that. I think the last connection that I want to make between Mormons and Scientologists for now is that I just did an interview with Nuance Ho. She's an Exmo creator. And she was saying that Scientologists um, created the I am a Scientologist campaign and Mormons went to you guys and were like, hey, how did you do that? We want to create an I am a Mormon campaign. Do you yeah. know anything about that? Well, I was working on the I'm a Scientologist campaign when that happened. Oh, wow. And we were kind of like, oh, cool. Look what the Mormons did. They, <laughs> they copied us. It was just like a compliment. That's so funny. But I have to tell you, it wasn't taken any other oh, way. Oh, funny. Like, because it wasn't like, it wasn't seen as competition. Like, oh, those dang Mormons. <laughs> I say dang because that's what Mormons would say. <laughs> Shoot, those dang Mormons. You know, they're going to steal some of our people. We never, we never thought that. We just thought it was a compliment. But in all honesty, there had been a campaign for the armed forces. I think it was the army, you know, be all. Remember the army was like, be all that you can be. Mm -hmm. uh, that was their motto. And they had done this campaign where they wanted to highly personalize service members. So they'd, you know, there'd be some young, cute girl who was like a radio operator on a tank. And they'd go in and shoot, and they'd do a little thing. And we modeled Media Scientologists exactly from that. Oh, people copying people. So it wasn't like an original <laughs> idea. Hmm. Curious to know. So was there, um, kind of wrapping this back to you and, and your, your exit of Scientology, was there, a, was there a definitive moment for you as far as wanting to, to leave? Or was it a, a long kind of drawn out? deconstruction process for you, like it is for a lot of people that, that exit. Ernest Hemingway said, you go broke very slowly and then all at once. And I think that that's the same with leaving something. You leave very slowly and then all at once. So I left very slowly over a long period of time. And then when I suddenly, all of a sudden, had disengaged from them enough to realize that I had been exploited and owed them nothing and that it didn't matter what I did or what I said, they were always going to believe that they did more for me than I did for them or that it was incredibly off balance. Um, I just said, that's it. And I, and, and there were some people that I wanted to talk with who were, had been very good friends of mine, like Mike Rinder and Jeff Hawkins. And I sort of realized at that moment that I really missed those people that I had done you know, we, we were in the trenches together and, uh, 
you know, I just said, that's it. I'm done. I'm not going to interact with these people. So again, it happens slowly over a long period of time and then suddenly all at once. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think you mentioned off camera as well that it was 2020 that was kind of the catalyst that helped you introspect a little bit and finally decide to leave. Yeah. It wasn't so much introspect as it was uh, a disengagement Okay, that allowed enough of the cognitive, cognitive dissonance to die down. I worked with this actor once. It was an amazing guy who played a continuing role in some of the films I did in Scientology. And he had been one of the first Green Berets in 1964. He'd gone into Cambodia and he'd run, he'd, he wrote a book about it. It was called Operation Phoenix. He went into North Vietnam and they assassinated military and political leaders and, you know, carried their head back in a, in a bag for compliance and, and this guy was like a gentleman warrior. You would never think he was like that. And so I spent a lot of time talking with him about that stuff. And he told me it took him 10 years before he could walk in the forest and not be looking for tripwires mm. in his backyard in Connecticut where he lived. So, it, you know, it, it, there's a, the trauma, there's a lot of sort of self propelled triggers. Like for me, this is nothing like being in Vietnam, but uh, for me, it was the phone ringing. I literally, every time my cell phone would ring, when I, it didn't matter where I was, at gold, not at gold, my body would shoot uh, uh, like this adrenaline, like I just slammed the brakes on and almost hit a car, because I just never knew if it was going to be somebody saying, you know, you need to get up here right now. You need to drop what you're doing. You need to get up here right now. So what the pandemic did was, because I was able to disengage about four months later, my phone rang. And I didn't notice it. And then I noticed that I didn't notice it. Yeah. Mm. Like it changes your everything about your body. Like physiologically, you're, you're a rack. If, a, if the ringing of a phone can cause you to have a surge of adrenaline, you, you need to run really fast. I wonder, because you did clearly make a difference in these people's lives, the people that you taught how to become filmmakers who are doing better now, who escape Scientology. But I still have to wonder what your thoughts are as far as the morality of the bigger reach, because you were creating films that would bring people into Scientology, into a cult. So do you have any remorse or feelings about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) You know, in the film, sorry to use film references, not a great film, but fun, uh, Independence Day. And I think Mm -hmm. it was Jeff Goldblum who says, they're using our satellites against us. And so that's pretty much what Scientology does, except rather than using your satellites, they're using your sense of idealism. So the thing that I'm the most remorseful about is that, and I don't even think remorse is the right word because it's kind of a shame ridden sort of remorse and shame kind of go together. And, and, uh, but Scientology turns, and I think cults do this in general, where they're able to turn your idealism against you. Yeah. So uh, do I have remorse for enabling this organization? Yeah, I do. Uh, but I couldn't have enabled it if I didn't have a very strong sense of idealism that I was fooled into bringing, uh, into allowing to be harnessed to help them. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I didn't sneak off to hide in the corner and feel shitty about what I did. You know what I'm saying? I'm here to talk about it because I think, I mean, I survived addiction. I survived Scientology. Okay. So, uh, and I never talked about the addiction part of it because I'd walked away from it so thoroughly. Like it wasn't even part of my life anymore, but I realized if I was going to have to speak out about Scientology, I would have to go back and revisit that. Right. Mm. Cause that was another life. Like, that person didn't exist for my kids, didn't exist for a lot of people, but it was my origin story into Scientology. So now I have to speak about it. And I thought it that message could also help people who find themselves in this grip of addiction, which is, yeah. it's just a response to trauma in your life. So do I feel bad for enabling? Is that your question? I'm trying to. Well, I guess it's it's something that, that happens a lot within cults is they utilize your talents to better the cult. And like you said, you are willing because, you know, they tell you in Mormonism, for example, your talents are because God gave you these talents. And so your job is to share these talents in the church. So whether that's playing the piano or singing, 
Exactly. They don't belong to you. You have to share them. And so I know the way in which they can twist it and make you feel obligated to share. And it simultaneously makes you feel special that you have this ability to give to this organization. And then when you find out what right. they're doing is twisting it and using it for wrong, then of course, I imagine it would come with a lot of guilt or sense of you were exploited for something in a way that you didn't think you were making that certain impact. And so I just wondered how you felt now, knowing the information that you know now, knowing that there were people kept in a hole, in quote, the hole, which is just like this awful prison entrapment for people who did something wrong, knowing that that was steps away from you or knowing that you're bringing people into this organization that ultimately causes harm. I can just imagine the feelings that would come with that. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, but I've had enough uh, shame and blaming myself because that's what Scientology wants you to do. Yeah. I've had enough to last a lifetime. So I really don't give a shit about any of that. Uh, but I think there's an there's a aspect of it. Like, I don't feel like I was amoral. I mean, there's things that I, in my own personal life, that I regret more than I regret having done that. And I think you'll be able to resonate with this from your uh, Mormon past uh, and, and religious people in general will that the importance of the mission really trumps all of that stuff. Like in Scientology, you have one chance to save the consciousness of all humanity forever. And mm -hmm. this is it. So there's a certain amount of being of people being punched in the face or living on beans and rice that is completely justifiable in that context because they interfered with the mission. Do you get what I'm saying? So that's kind of your mindset. Sure. Yeah. Like yeah. that's that's why you can sort of turn a blind eye on the thing. So I don't I I, I mean I'm I'm gonna probably send you notes later about how I had further thoughts on that. Maybe I'm still unpacking that to the point yeah. where I can't really give you a, a full complete answer because there isn't one. Uh, but you know, nobody joins a cult uh, that joins something good and then they yeah. find out they got screwed over. Yeah, of course. A lot of times we find that these, um, you know, people like you that are, that are self-proclaimed idealists that were on this huge mission to save the world through Scientology and, and then you no longer have that what happens to that energy? Is that something that is idle within you? Or do you just feel like it's time to um, drop those idealistic tendencies away and, and just do other things? Well, I think you are who you are. And I think one of the most traumatizing things about being in any kind of an intense group like that is that in order to move in it, how much you have to compromise your own values it's maybe one of the most tra traumatizing things that will ever happen to you is when you make a decision and based on that decision, you compromise your own values. So you do get those values back, but you you have to walk away from all of the trauma that was caused by it. Like I found myself really motivated to speak out because I, I do have a strong sense of idealism. I would like to see the world, uh, the, the amount of harm in the world be reduced. I do believe that the greatest quality of humankind is kindness. Through some kind of transformation, we can move into a kinder world where, you know, help and kindness have been used for as long as you can remember on the history of humankind to draw people in, to lure people in, and then take advantage of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no better way to draw a person in than to say, look, I'm going to help you. And uh, this is something that even Scientology harnesses to say, well, there's been so much, ba so much bad help throughout the, uh, the millennia that now when we offer to help people, they think we're evil. Like they even weaponize that. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Sure. But uh, you don't lose it. You don't just say damn me for being an idealist, that's just not even worth it. You don't, like, I didn't find myself becoming incredibly cynical. I wanted to reconnect with my kids in a way I never had. I wanted to reconnect with people in a way I never had. I wanted to develop friendships that I never had. And I mean, I'm still pretty isolated from being gone for so long, but, um, you know, you don't have friends in Scientology because one of the basic uh, roles of a friend 
is that there's somebody you can confide in. Well, you can't confide in anybody in Scientology because if you go to them to tell them, you know, look, I'm having doubts about my marriage or I'm thinking on or whatever, they're just going to put it on the church. They're going to write a report. Yeah. They're going to, you know, because they think that that's helping you. But sometimes you just need to talk to somebody. And that's why you have friends. Uh, so you don't have any friends. So, you know, I'm like, I can have friends now. I've spoken with people that had left that. So, yeah, to answer your question, I think what you're asking is, do you become cynical? I mean, if it stayed quiet within you, that would be, I think, a form of cynicism that you would think it's not worth expressing your idealism. But like things I've thought about becoming registered as a drug counselor because of my own past experience, just being able to say, hey, I did it. You can do it, too, can be very helpful for people. You know, you, you think about that. Speaking out, the whole reason I'm doing it is, is to try to present like an authentic human experience where people can look at it and go, oh, yeah, life can be very painful and it can be very traumatic. And, but, and we're all on a similar journey. You know, it's like this, what do you call it? The, uh, the imposter syndrome. Yeah, imposter syndrome. Thanks. It's really good for people to sort of be speaking with one another. And so they realize that then we all internally, all of us, many of us share certain uh, vulnerabil vulnerabilities and insecurities. And by seeing that, it helps to overcome them. And plus, I did so much messaging for this organization, which was really enabling the furtherance of more harm. Like the Scientology has really done a lot of harm that if I don't try to write that, then I think eventually that would be the next thing that would be very difficult to deal with. Yeah. And I also think it's really great that you're writing a book. Yeah. It's, it started out as cathartic. I waited till the point when I felt I could start writing without doing it for revenge. Because mm. I think the worst reason to do anything is out of revenge, especially write a book. Uh, so yeah, it's just, it's a lot of stuff in it. Uh, hopefully it'll be out within a month or two. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, I just have to thank you for coming on and sharing your story and for speaking out. And Anytime. I know it takes a lot. And definitely, guys, if you want to check out his book, we are going to link his new YouTube channel in the description below. If you click it and you subscribe, he's going to be posting updates about the release of his book. And yeah, I just really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, it's great talking with you guys. Thank you so much, Mitch. I, I really want you to know that commercial still lives with me. The <laughs> Dianetics by L. Ron Hubbard. I didn't know what I was watching at the time as an eight, <laughs> nine-year-old 90s television, but I remember seeing that. It was yeah. uh, ubiquitous. Yeah, it was a big deal. Part of you lives on in, in, in my memories somewhere <laughs> of that. So. But <laughs> before we go, I have to get your Linda Listen moment, your sassy statement to someone who's pissed you off, or just inspiration for our viewers today. Oh, man. Um, being a behind the camera guy for so long, um, I, I am really prone to performance anxiety. So you just triggered my performance anxiety. Oh, no. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I were to give an example of one that I think would be good for you, it would be something like, Linda, listen, you don't own my talents anymore. You will not exploit my talents anymore. And I'm going to do everything to turn around and exploit what you've been doing to these innocent people. That would be my Linda Listen for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So um, can we just take a break while I memorize? It? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have something to add, absolutely. But if you can't think of anything, that's okay. No, no, no. I have. I generally have a lot of these things. I mean, I used to write slogans for the Church of Scientology. <laughs> uh, people ask me what you did for a living. I would say I, wrote, I write bumper stickers. Just that, you know, we all need to do whatever we can do to make the world a... Um, a less harmful place to live in. And in terms of Scientology, look, I was reluctant to speak out for a while. And the reason was there's people in Scientology, some Sea Org members, some at Gold, who genuinely helped me when I was having personal crises. And I thought just out of respect for those people and their idealism, regardless of how deluded they may be and so forth, I, I wanted them to be able to live their lives, to be on their journey, to find their way forward without my interference. And then I realized that remaining silent, it never helps an abused person. Mm -hmm. It only helps the abuser. And so that's the reason why it's important for people to speak out. Yeah. If I really cared about these people, then I would speak out. 
And and at first I was not speaking out because I cared about them. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you again. Do you have any final thoughts before we go? No, except my final thoughts are really about you guys. I think you guys are doing great work, and I just have tremendous respect for you. Or I would not have come here today. And I, I tell you, as you're expanding your operation, I cannot tell you how much I, uh, I really wish you all the best because history is going to look back. Like social media is such a toilet bowl. History is going to look back and they're going to see the emergence of kind of a, a, a community of like-minded people that actually outside of politics, outside of religion, outside of business, they all came together individually as their own little enterprise and made a real change. And that's kind of my idealism. <laughs> Thank you so much. So thanks so for being much. a part of this. Thank you, Mitch. That, that really we means a lot. That. Thank you. You're very welcome. And we'll do it again, I hope. Yes, yes, definitely. For everyone else watching, uh, we'll link Mitch's information in the description below if you want to get in touch with him. And if you want to support the podcast, liking and sharing and subscribing is amazing. But if you want to go that extra mile, you can become a patron. Patreon.com slash Colts to Consciousness. And babe, do you want to give our outro? <sighs> I have a little bit of performance anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> it's contagious. Uh, and with that. Until next time. Until next time. Follow your highest excitement. Be conscious and be well. I knew you could do it. I love you. <laughs>